Do you show forth the fruits of the Spirit in your life? Sure, you have the form, the outward actions of godliness, but do you have the power? I'm not asking you if you're sinless, but if the Holy Spirit lives and dwells within you, you will be changed, radically changed. Your life will no longer be consumed with patterns of worldly cares and pursuits and sin, interrupted only occasionally by brief periods of individual acts of righteousness. But no, it will be consumed with patterns of righteousness, interrupted only occasionally by brief periods of worldly pursuits and cares and occasional unintentional sin. You may be tempted to point to pastors or teachings or even entire churches that tell you otherwise, that insist you can be a Christian and still live in patterns of sin and carnality, going through life pursuing primarily worldly things and fulfilling worldly desires and not repenting of everything you know to be wrong. But we're talking here about not just calling ourselves Christians, we're talking about actually being Christian, as Scripture describes true and genuine and authentic Christianity. And this is what Scripture says. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. And he who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning, because he has been born of God. And this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. That's what scripture says. Now, I understand the standard of genuine Christianity is set very high, but it seems to me man has always had two choices when confronted with that reality. Number one, bring the standard down, or number two, bring their lives up. The modern church seems to be opting more and more for option number one, bring the standard down. Now, of course, no church would ever concede that that is what they're doing. Now, instead, they would use terms like, oh, we're under grace and nobody's perfect and we're all covered by the blood anyway. And then when Christians don't act like Christians, it's okay because we're told that Jesus loves the sinners but hates the sin. But where's the power? It doesn't take much power to just change the standard by bringing it down, but it sure does take a lot of power to bring a life up to that standard. That's why in Matthew chapter 19, verse 25, Jesus' disciples, who understood this very point, cried out in desperation exactly what you should be crying out right now. Who then can be saved? In other words, if scriptural Christianity is the only genuine Christianity, if scriptural Christianity is the only Christianity that takes a person to heaven, then who's going? This must be impossible. And of course, that was exactly Jesus' point, which is why he answered, this is impossible for man, but all things are possible with God. The bottom line is, the standard of genuine Christianity is scriptural Christianity, and it's too high too high for a person to achieve on their own or by just cleaning up some of their grosser, more socially unacceptable sins. That's why scripture declares that it takes nothing short of the power of God to make that change. The same power that the Bible says raised Jesus Christ literally from the dead is the power that the Bible also says is required to raise us spiritually from the dead and convert us, change us, transform us into these new creations that may not be sinless, but surely and radically are transformed. Transformed so radically that our lives legitimately become a progressive revelation of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Things like love and joy and peace and so on. Just as it was true in those first believers in the book of Acts. So you who profess a new faith in Jesus Christ, you may not be an immediate perfect picture of the Apostle Paul right away, but do you have the power or just the form of godliness? Are you humble? 
Do you know that anything God does to save or change you is undeserved grace? Are you teachable and advisable to the point that when you hear each sermon, you're cut to the heart over something every single time? And so confess your sins and repent and purpose to change? Or are you stubborn, self-willed, high-minded, assuming now that you're a Christian, well, you pretty much have arrived. Are you submissive and obedient to your spiritual superiors? Or do you make yourself the arbiter of truth and error, nitpicking the pastors and teacher sermons for style over substance, or applying the message to other people instead of to yourself? Are you diligent in this comparatively joyful and pleasant work of serving the Lord, pursuing your studies in the Word with all your strength? Do you redeem the time, making the most of every minute by crowding in as much Bible study as you can every day? Or is it closer to the truth that you waste hour after hour, day after day, either in reading what is no tendency towards Christianity or in some business or recreational pursuit, or you know not what? And how about your money? Are you any better managers of your money than you are of your time? For example, have you made it a goal of principle to make every effort possible to, as scripture says, owe no man anything by staying out of debt of any kind? Do you tithe by giving at least 10% of your gross income each week to the church? Do you save all you can in the sense of not spending your money unnecessarily so that you can self-sacrificially give all you can to whoever you can? Do you remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, to spend it not going your own way in idle recreation, but in worship and honor to God, finding your rest and refreshment in Him instead of the world? Or for you, has it become the Lord's couple of hours instead of the Lord's day? Does your life live up to your calling? In other words, do you live like someone who has really seen an invisible God with the eyes of your soul and who knows he is always present and watching? Isn't it instead true that many of you, for example, can actually take the Lord's name in vain, even constantly without any remorse or fear? Or that you can not only sit idly by when others do it, but pay money to see others do it in movies and plays across the country? Isn't it really true that despite what some of us like to tell ourselves when we slow down enough and stop and really think about it, as Christians, we've really become a generation of triflers, as the old timers like Wesley and Spurgeon used to call people, who profess to be Christians, but we're not all that serious about God and the things of God? In other words, don't we more or less dabble with and sort of play at our Christianity? one foot in Christ and one foot in the world. It seems like a strange thing that anyone, much less so many, would trifle with God and Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, for that they would trifle with their own souls. But I fear more and more from each generation to the next, it's really become true. But listen to what one of the greatest preachers of God's word, Charles Spurgeon, once wrote about trifling with God. And remember, he wrote this over 300 years ago. If religion be false, it is the basest imposition under heaven. But if the religion of Christ be true, it is the most solemn truth that ever was known. It is not a thing that a man desires to trifle with if it be true. For it is at his soul's peril to make a jest of it. But if it be not true, it is detestable. But if it be true, it deserves all a man's faculties to consider it, and all his powers to obey it. It is not a trifle. Briefly consider why it is not. It deals with your soul. If it dealt with your body, it were no trifle, for it is well to have the limbs of the body sound. But it has to do with your soul. As much as a man is better than the garments that he wears, so much is the soul better than the body. It is your immortal soul it deals with. Your soul has to live forever, and the religion of Christ deals with its destiny. Can you laugh at such words as heaven and hell, at glory and damnation? If you can, if you think these trifles, then is the faith of Christ to be trifled with? Consider also with whom it connects you. 
with God, before whom angels bow themselves and veil their faces. Trifle with your monarch if you will, but not with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Recollect that those who have ever known anything of it tell you it is no child's play. And sinners too, when they are in their senses, find it no trifle. When they come to die, they find it no little thing to die without Christ. When conscience gets the grip of them and shakes them, they find it no small thing to be without hope of pardon, with guilt upon the conscience and no means of getting rid of it. And sirs, true ministers of God, feel it to be no trifle. I do myself feel it to be such an awful thing to preach God's gospel, that if it were not woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel, I would resign my charge this moment. I would not for the proudest consideration under heaven know the agony of mind I felt but this one morning before I ventured upon this platform. Nothing but the hope of winning souls from death and hell and the stern conviction that we have to deal with the grandest of all realities would bring me here. It is no trifle to us, we do assure you. Oh, make it no trifle to yourselves. I know I speak to some triflers this morning and perhaps to some trifling professors. Oh, professors, do not live so as to make worldlings think that your religion is a trifling thing. Be cheerful, but oh, be holy, be happy, for that is your privilege. But oh, be heavenly minded, for that is your duty. Let men see that you are not flirting with Christ, but that you are married to him. Let them see that you are not dabbling in this as in a little speculation, but that it is the business of your life, the stern business of all your powers to live to Christ, Christ also living in you. Now, some may still be thinking, oh, most people don't trifle with God. But let me ask you, do you even spend an hour a week in private prayer? How often does God come up in your general day-to-day -day conversations? I'm fascinated by the reality that people can read Jesus' own words that we are to love him with all our hearts, all our minds, and all our strength. And yet 15 minutes after leaving a Sunday morning church service, his name doesn't come up in a conversation for the rest of the day, and sometimes not even throughout the entire week. Where are the people today who are, to any real degree, acquainted with the work of God's Holy Spirit? what he does and how he shows himself in a person's life. Isn't it closer to the truth that when people speak passionately and enthusiastically about the Holy Spirit and God and the things of God, that most, even professing Christians, take it for granted that they're either self-deceived or fanatical or somehow hypocrites in making those statements? And anyway, isn't it true that people today can't bear with long sermons? or a lot of talk for any length of time on God and the things of God. Take this very teaching, for example. It's a three-part mini-series, three hours of instruction on what biblical Christianity really looks, walks, and talks like. But I'm under no false pretenses or delusions that everyone who has the opportunity is going to sit through all three hours, much less that they'll pay attention to it, much less still that they'll grasp and respond to it. Nevertheless, I'm called to present the information to those whom God has ordained to hear it, not to dictate the results. But considering the fact that biblical Christianity is the only genuine Christianity, and genuine Christianity is the only faith that brings a person to heaven, wouldn't it be reasonable to think that people would muster the self-discipline to work through the content of these programs? That despite what you may be able to say about the presentation of the material, the material itself, the content, would be anything but dry or uninteresting or irrelevant? Well, not so in this age, unfortunately, of give me what I want to hear and give it to me quick and, by the way, make sure it's entertaining. Now, we're so inundated with high-tech media and entertainment here in America, and we've become so distracted from God and the things of God that the plain, straight preaching of God's Word has become, well, out of style socially irrelevant, even for people professing to be Christians. In the name of the Lord God Almighty, I ask you, what religion are you of? When even the talk of true Christianity for any length of time bores you, and has to be sugar-coated and bathed in humor and entertainment, 
Oh, my brothers and sisters, it's time to ask, where are the genuine Christians? Which is the Christian city or Christian state or Christian country? And what are the chances, speaking in human terms, that Christianity, true scriptural Christianity, will again be the religion of this country, where all ranks and positions of men will speak and live like men filled with the Holy Spirit? Who will stand in the gap? Because, says scripture, the eyes of the Lord range across the earth, searching for a heart that is fully committed to him, so that he may strengthen that person to fulfill his work. Are you that person? Will you choose to be that person? Then let me close by asking you, do you believe true Christianity that saves men's souls is the kind of Christianity that so fills a man with God's Holy Spirit that he displays the fruit of that Spirit as defined by Scripture and as briefly described in those past three word picture programs? Do you desire, deeply desire God to restore it to this land, to your home, your church, your city, and to this country? And can you put your fortune, your freedom, your loved ones, your very life on the altar so that you may be instrumental in the restoring of genuine Christianity to this land? And even if you have the desire, who of you has the power? Would it come from someone in authority? which by all rights it should, since pastors and fathers and ruling officials are called to set the example and lead the people? Or will it come from some young or unknown man or group of men? I'm not sure those in authority would stand for that because it would be such a reproach to their own sinfulness, hypocrisy, and lack of power. But unfortunately, perhaps there's not all that much danger of any of this being put to the test since sin and complacency has become so common and accepted, it's overspread us all like a flood. What then will God send to awaken us? A famine? The total loss of our young people to drugs and sex and violence? Or the final warnings of God to a guilty land? Epidemic, illness, wars. I fear he's long been warning us with all of this. And ironically, instead of reforming us into our first love, they only seem to harden us further in our ways. Oh, surely we should cry out with David, rather let us fall into your hand, O Lord, than into the hands of men. Truth be known, whether we're speaking of our own personal Christianity or our home or our church or our city or our nation, if we, like the crowd of 3,000 that day as described in the book of Acts, are cut to the heart when we see our lives in comparison to genuine scriptural Christianity, and there's only one place to turn and only one plea to make. Lord, you must save us. You must change us, or we will surely perish. We beg you, take us out of the muck and mire, or it will most surely overtake us. Lord Almighty God, help us against our enemies, and especially against ourselves, because the help of man is vain and empty and worthless. Save us not according to our works or our strength, but according to your mercy and your power, not as we will, but that your will might be done. And with that thought, we must beg God to return true Christianity to our hearts and lives and to our nation until he does. I'll leave you with Peter's response to the people's question when they asked, what must we do to be saved? This is what Peter said. He said, one, repent. Turn away from the things that you know to be wrong permanently. Two, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust him for your salvation, not your own good works. And three, do something about it. Be proactive about your faith. Immerse yourself in Christ. Study his word. Don't just read it. Meditate on it and identify with him by learning of him and following him and bearing witness to others in his name by doing what you learn in his strength. May God have mercy on our souls.